One of the big promises of the Copilot Pro license announced in January, alongside faster GPT-4 access and the addition of Copilot in the Microsoft 365 apps if you're appropriately licensed, was the addition of a custom GPT builder reminiscent of what we've had as part of ChatGPT Plus for many months. That custom GPT builder is now here to preview, so in this video I'm going to take a look at it. What could it do? How does it compare to the GPT builder that's part of ChatGPT? And how does it fit in to the wider Copilot landscape? As always, all the screen recording you'll see in this video is done in demo environments where you're not seeing anyone's private information. But before we dive in, a quick introduction. My name is Nick DeCorsi. I'm the owner of Bright Ideas Agency, a digital transformation consulting company focused on the needs of small and medium-sized businesses. I share information here to help you navigate the artificial intelligence age with a particular focus on Microsoft 365 and Copilot. If you enjoy what you see here, then it would be great if you'd give the video a like to help it get in front of more people, and please subscribe to the channel if you want to keep up to speed on topics such as this. So jumping into copilot.microsoft.com with a Copilot Pro enabled account, we can now see you get Copilot GPTs on the right above your chat history. By default, you're seeing a list of Microsoft's created GPTs, designer, vacation planner, cooking assistant, and fitness trainer, as well as a link to see all Copilot GPTs. If you click on this, the top option is to use the GPT Builder Preview. But I suppose before we dive too far in here, there's a question many of you might be asking. What is a GPT? GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer, and this is really the type of AI model that's in use here. And while we generally use the term large language model to describe what the GPT-4 model that underlies Copilot is, it is more accurate to describe it as a GPT model. This makes the term custom GPT confusing, as this would imply you are building a customized AI model, but this isn't the case nor is it the case when you build a Copilot with Copilot Studio. The underlying AI tooling Microsoft provides is the same. I think it's easier to think of it from a branding perspective. We're familiar with ChatGPT as a brand, but other AI services like AutoGPT also take this naming approach to highlight a specific tool and its connection to the GPT model. When you build a custom GPT, whether you're doing so with Copilot or with ChatGPT, what you're doing is giving your tool some form of bounded contextual data and additional system prompts that control how the AI model interprets and responds to the requests that are made. While these techniques are useful to customise your experience, they are very different to building a custom AI model from scratch. From a purely technical perspective, understanding this difference is important, but as we explore these capabilities, you'll see that understanding the practical implications is also vital. So if we click on the button to create a GPT, you are presented with a Copilot GPT settings screen and instructions on how to get started. From here, you can converse with Copilot to build the GPT and upload files related to what you are trying to build. You can also jump over to the Configure tab where you can see what is going on in the background, and you can define a name, a description, create instructions, upload knowledge, and decide what capabilities the GPT should have, either web browsing or image generation. I'm going to start with something really basic. I'm going to create a Copilot GPT to help answer questions about Microsoft 365, and I can do that with natural language just by prompting Copilot. I start with the prompt, you will be an advisor for users of Microsoft 365, answering questions about how to use the apps, licensing, and other related questions related to the technologies in the Microsoft 365 suite. It processes that request, and next it suggests a name for your Copilot GPT. You go through a conversation where it asks for clarification around how to answer questions or any special requests, but from here you are just about ready to roll. You can continue to tinker here if you want though. In the background on the configure page, your conversation is being turned into instructions, so Copilot is working with you to essentially tailor itself to your needs. You can review the instructions and work with them here, or return to the chat and continue to work conversationally. But when you are ready, you can preview your Copilot GPT. And then you get a Copilot window with the name of your Copilot GPT at the top, and you can just go ahead and use it like you would Copilot normally. In this case, asking questions about Microsoft 365 and getting perfectly adequate responses. 
So you might be thinking, what's the point of this? I could just ask Copilot about Microsoft 365 normally. And that's true, this is a basic example. But the more niche or specific your need, the better this approach can help, as you can work to tailor the type of response you get. For example, building a tailored approach to how the response is constructed, so it's more useful to the way you research or the types of writing tasks you do. If you're happy with your Copilot GPT, you can go ahead and publish it, either for you or as a shared GPT. And then you could use it along with other GPTs you have. However, the power of this approach is not just about customising the way inputs are interpreted or outputs are generated. It's also about bounding the context data Copilot uses to service the request. Let's try another slightly more complex example. This is the Power Platform Licensing Guide for February 2024. It's a fairly heavy 33-page PDF that details everything one might want to know about Power Platform Licensing. And until Microsoft releases a later version, this is what you should rely on. Getting tools like Copilot or ChatGPT to respond with this level of specificity in where answers come from is ordinarily pretty hard. And you end up saying you want to use the latest information, but find you get a web page from five years ago included in the result. Here I'm building another GPT, but different to last time, I'm going to upload the Microsoft Power Platform Licensing Guide and be highly specific about the fact that I want the answers to come from that resource. There are any number of potential use cases where strictly bounding the context of data will be important to efficacy. Perhaps you are building a legal GPT and you want to ensure the law documents used are from your country, or you're a fan of a particular public domain book series and you want a GPT that is going to answer questions addressed by the author in their work, but not the analysis of other readers from across the internet. So I jump into the GPT to preview it and ask a question that definitely requires some fairly current information. How do I license Copilot Studio and how much does it cost? And it gives me an answer. But despite me being specific about what source I wanted to use, you can see it referencing websites. And while Microsoft sites are likely to be equally up to date, I'm not sure about Trustradius as an up to date source. So I don't want my GPT searching the web at all. I want it to use the document I uploaded as its knowledge. So I can jump back into my configuration screen for the GPT, turn off web browsing, and try again. And now, it ignores the document I uploaded completely and tells me it doesn't have any information as of its last update. So what's going on here? I took time earlier in the video to focus on the fact that despite these being called GPTs, you are not building a custom AI model. You are just building a set of custom instructions sitting on top of the existing AI model GPT-4. By uploading a document, you're using a technique called RAG, or Retrieval Augmented Generation. This is where you essentially interject additional contextual information into the cycle that you're getting of the request and the response. And by using that additional contextually bounded information, you end up with a better response. This is essentially how Copilot for Microsoft 365 works. GPT-4 is still in there and still has the limitation of having been trained on a vast set of data with a cutoff point well before Copilot Studio was ever announced or released. And despite me uploading appropriate contextual information and being specific that this is what I want Copilot to use, it relied upon its internal training knowledge to answer my question rather than the document, so it didn't actually use that RAG technique at all. I can get it to use the document by prepending the phrase using your uploaded knowledge to the request. But given that I could upload a document normally and do this, it seems like a strange workaround. But in this case, it gives an answer that clearly comes from the document. The problem here, though, is that in this specific case, it's very clear that the document wasn't being used to answer the question. But this is kind of a fluke based on me asking for something that happened after the end of training GPT-4. There are an endless sea of possibilities of documents I could upload connected with topics that are in GPT-4's training dataset, and I could be inadvertently getting answers I would think would be coming from my document that are instead coming from some unknown source GPT-4 was trained on. But I guess this is a hard problem to solve, right? Let's take a look at ChatGPT to find out. But before we do, I want to ask you a question. What's your approach to AI adoption in your business? 
If you're yet to start building your plan and you're not sure where to start, you might benefit from my new on-demand course, Fly into the Age of Copilots, focused on helping leaders in small and medium-sized businesses learn about AI technology and its benefits. And right now, for a limited period, it's completely free. Check it out at the link below. So here I am in ChatGPT's GPT Builder, and I've set up a GPT with exactly the same instructions, file for knowledge, and settings, such as web browsing being turned off, that I had in Copilot. And I'll try the same prompt. ChatGPT is successful in using the file straight out of the gate, but interestingly, it does give an answer that is less nuanced than the one Copilot gave when you forced it to use the file. It details Copilot Studio licensing, but does not differentiate the fact that Copilot Studio is also available to Copilot for Microsoft 365 users in the way that Copilot did. If I turn web browsing back on, I get much the same answer, and there's still no evidence that ChatGPT is searching the web for more context. This answer is a little broader, but on first review, it appears it's all information that would have come from the licensing guide. On this simple test, I'm not impressed with Copilot's GPT builder. I think wanting to apply boundaries to the context is a fairly foundational use case for this sort of tool. This RAG capability is pretty core to the value proposition of this sort of product, and Copilot just doesn't seem to be as good at it as ChatGPT. Even if when you cajole Copilot, it definitely uses your context to provide a moderately better answer. Additionally, there are just more options in ChatGPT's GPT Builder to help you build something more sophisticated. By turning on Code Interpreter, you get access to features like creating files with ChatGPT, and the Actions option gives you the ability to call any external API to get data from exactly where you want with up-to-the-minute accuracy. Frankly, the GPT Builder in ChatGPT has a set of features that align somewhere as a middle road between Copilot's GPT Builder and Copilot Studio. And in this, I think Microsoft has taken a bit of a wrong turn here. Assuming the GPT Builder works as described, it's in preview right now and it clearly needs a lot of work before it's out of preview. I could see a lot of business users with Copilot for Microsoft 365 licenses who would be completely scared off by the sheer complexity of Copilot Studio, who might find value in a basic interface like the Copilot GPT Builder or the ChatGPT GPT Builder to create small enhancements to the usability of Copilot for their day-to-day -day work. Imagine if you could turn on different GPTs in Outlook to draft emails for different purposes perhaps with a different set of knowledge documents, and share them around your team in an interface as straightforward as the Copilot GPT Builder. You could probably teach an entire team how to do this end-to-end -end in the same amount of time it would take to explain all the options on the main menu of Copilot Studio. But conversely, those who are passionate enough about AI to shell out $20 per month on their own Copilot Pro subscription are often probably the same people who are excited to try out features like ChatGPT's API actions and would love to get their hands on the power of Copilot Studio. If you're a more basic user with no interest in playing with AI, then you're not going to buy Copilot Pro. You're not even going to try Copilot unless your business buys you a license. Are you a Copilot Pro user? Do you agree with this point, or are you pleased to see a basic GPT builder come to Copilot? Let me know down in the comments. Overall, I appreciate that Microsoft is bringing this capability that seems to be so liked by ChatGPT Plus subscribers to Copilot Pro. They need to make it work better, and for equivalency, they need to add a couple more features. But if Copilot Pro has a GPT builder on par with ChatGPT's, then Copilot Pro's value becomes even more compelling especially for those who use or are interested in using the Microsoft 365 productivity suite for personal or family needs. However, again, this is a case of a product clearly marked as a preview, but with big issues that need to be fixed. I have no issue with there being previews that are somewhat broken, but the degree to which Microsoft continues to eliminate the friction of getting hands-on with preview features alarms me. It has been the case for decades that those who are technically adept or just adventurous could try out pre-release features across lots of software, but there was always a level of friction. 
Perhaps you needed to download a completely different install package, for example. That made it clear you were doing something that was out of the ordinary. But then came Google's Gmail that was in beta for about a decade and all sense of users actually understanding the care that should be used in relying on pre-release software vanished. And with Copilot, and frankly across Microsoft 365, Microsoft continues with this trend. With any of these previews, is it actually clear what features are being previewed and which we should be cautious of? Is it just the concept of the software overall? Is our investment in building GPTs likely to be for nothing, as at the end of the preview they'll all be wiped and we'll need to start again? We are also used to using software where it's entirely unclear what should be working and what shouldn't, and which features we should be able to see and which we shouldn't. And there's always the likelihood that I record a video like this, and a few days later when you see it, the system works entirely differently without any indication that anything has changed. Anyhow, there is one good thing about all these changes. Lots of content for new videos. Thanks for watching through to the end. Until the next video, bye bye.